All right, so welcome everyone to our 590 seminar. This week we have two presenters. Our first presenter is Ija Zhang from Dr. Palawa's research group. Uh, after graduating from Tsinghua University in China in 2015 with a bachelor's in electrical engineering, Ija joined our group and has been working for two years on his master's degree, which he just finished over the summer, on partial power processing for data centers, which he'll be discussing today. Outside of the lab, uh, Ija enjoys badminton, and uh, so hopefully we'll all get to know Ija a little better and what he's working on with his research. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Ija. Mm. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ija. Uh, so um, today I'm going to, um, so my presentation will be uh, like a practice presentation for the upcoming conference, ECC. Uh, so let me try. OK, so today I will present an uh, alternative power delivery architecture for data centers uh, that can achieve a much higher power delivery efficiency than conventional architectures. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is the outline of my presentation. So first of all, I will talk about the motivation and then uh, some analysis into um, the proposed uh, power delivery architecture. And after that, I will present my control algorithm and, uh, uh, and then the hardware to prototype uh, I built and finally reach the conclusion. So first of all, the motivation. So uh, data centers consume a lot of uh, electric energy uh, nowadays. So for example, in 2014, uh, U.S. data centers consume 2% uh, of the national electricity. And uh, so uh, servers are the key component in data centers that consume the electric energy. And, uh, and they use a low DC voltage as their input. So uh, we need a power delivery architecture to convert the um, uh, grid AC voltage into the low DC voltage that servers can use. So since servers are con consuming uh, such a great amount of energy, uh, we want to save, um, we want to deliver all the energy to the servers, but not uh, lose them in their power delivery architecture. So that's why we want to improve the power delivery efficiency of the power delivery architecture. And uh, so, um, what, what is a conventional power delivery architecture? Uh, so we need to learn about it so that we can improve on, upon it. So shown in this figure is the conventional power delivery architecture. Uh, here, uh, AC to DC converter, uh, a rectifier um, converts the grid AC voltage and to uh, um, bus voltage, DC, high, uh, DC bus voltage. And then uh, there are dedicated DC-DC converters uh, for each server that steps down the high DC bus voltage and uh, provide the power for the servers. So we can see that um, uh, for, uh, for the DC-DC converters, they process the full server power. And um, if we look at the power delivery efficiency inside this dash line box, which is after the DC bus, um, we see that the power delivery efficiency is actually limited to the efficiency of the individual power converters. Uh, so uh, is there a better way to do this? Let's look at the series stacked power delivery architecture. So actually, uh, we leverage the fact that the servers in data centers, they actually consume a similar uh, amount of power. And also, there are a lot of them. So um, if we connect them in series, um, so, so they will like build up to the um, DC bus voltage and uh, uh, like inherently divide the voltage inside themselves. So for example, um, the servers, uh, they actually, um, they usually run from uh, 12 volt or 48 volt input voltage. So let's assume a 12 volt uh, server. And the DC bus is uh, usually, uh, it can be 48 volt, which is the case in uh, the Blue Waters data center at University of Illinois. Uh, so if we um, connect four ser servers in series 
And uh, ideally, if they consume exactly the same amount of power, then they inherently derive the voltage themselves, and we don't need any form of power conversion. So the power delivery effic uh, efficiency will be 100% in theory. Uh, but uh, in reality, what if the uh, server power is not identical? Um, and then we, we introduce differential power processing to solve this problem. So we can have uh, bidirectional uh, power DCC converters called differential power processing converters to compensate for the difference in the server's current. Uh, like we connect them in the intermediate node between the servers. And uh, uh, since we have these converters, uh, we can now satisfy uh, the case, uh, the Kirchhoff current law um, uh, in this power delivery architecture, even if the server has um, non-identical uh, cur current uh, or power con consumption. Uh, and uh, these power converters, the differential power converters that we introduced, they only process the difference in service power. So um, uh, since they process uh, the difference in service power, not the full server power, um, uh, the power going through them is much, le uh, much less, so the power lost in these converters is also much less. And uh, uh, we can gain extremely high efficiency. Uh, so shown in this plot is an example of the um, power uh, processed, a comparison between the conventional and the series stack architecture. So these red bars are the server power consumption. And in the conventional architecture, the power converters process the full uh, server power, which are just these red bars. And uh, the blue bars are um, the difference in the server's power. So uh, that's um, uh, the, the amount uh, of power uh, that the converters process in the series stack architecture. So we can see that uh, in the series stack architecture, uh, the, the amount of power process is much smaller. So uh, we, we have um, much smaller loss and uh, uh, much higher efficiency. Um, so this is a conceptual idea. So actually, uh, so uh, in reality, how do we realize this differential power processing? Uh, we can actually use um, 48 volt to 12 volt uh, isolated DC-DC converters as the differential converters. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, as an example, we say that the four servers are consuming 8 amp, 8 amp, 10 amp, and 8 amp. And uh, so in this diagram, uh, um, th there is a string current, which is uh, the uh, current that goes through every server in the serial connection, but not uh, uh, passing through the differential converters. So let's say that um, uh, we can control the string current to be 8 amp, and also controlling the D DPP converter current output currents to be 0, 0, 2, and 0. And then the, the, current, uh, the uh, Kirchhoff current law is um, satisfied everywhere in the network, uh, network so uh, the servers will uh, operate normally. Uh, so this, this is how that we can realize the serious text architecture uh, in reality. And now let's calculate uh, the power process and the power loss. So actually we see that there, uh, only one converter is uh, processing power here. Uh, and its process power, which is its input power, is, uh, like, uh, its output power divided by its efficiency. And we are assuming 96% eff efficient converter here. So we see that the process power is 25 watt and the loss is 1 watt. And uh, what about the conventional architecture? We can also do a similar calculation. Uh, so actually, um, so by just removing this serious connection, we get what uh, was previously the conventional uh, power delivery architecture. And uh, we see that uh, in, under the same uh, server power consumption, the, uh, the converter, the DC DC converters are processing actually the fu uh, full server powers. So the process power is, we can calculate it as 425 watt. And the power loss is 17 watt. So this is much higher than the, uh, what is in the series stack architecture. So if we do, uh, do a comparison, we can see that uh, with the same output power to the servers, um, 
since the serial stack architecture is pro uh, um, processing much less power than the conventional architecture, it has much smaller power loss and uh, uh, a very, very high power delivery efficiency. Uh, so what I just uh, used as an example is actually one kind of realization of the serial stack architectures. Uh, it is called the server to bus architecture. There are actually two, uh, uh, there are three basic types, uh, and there are also the server to server and server to virtual bus. Um, these two types has been uh, investigated in detail um, uh, previously, uh, but the server to bus architecture haven't been investigated in detail, and it is the focus uh, of my research. Uh, so the server to bus uh, serial stack architecture, it has some unique properties. Uh, first of all, it is able to um, achieve the minimum total process power uh, for most uh, server load distributions in the server, uh, serial stack. So to understand this, let's look at the, uh, look at, look at the same example. Uh, for example, uh, so the servers are consuming these um, uh, these mm, values of uh, currents as before. And uh, so previously we say that the string current is controlled at eight times. So these are the corresponding DPP converter currents. Uh, actually the string current is not uh, fixed at this uh, single value. You can have other values. For example, we can control the string current to be 8.5 watt uh, amp and uh, control the uh, DPP converter currents to be these values, and uh, uh, the, the Kirchhoff current law uh, still uh, satisfies, so the servers are uh, still uh, able to work normally. So if we summarize this, uh, we can see that uh, uh, I show two scenarios uh, where the system can work. Actually, uh, there are infinite uh, number of possibilities, combinations uh, that the system can work. The string current can be uh, any arbitrary value as long as the DPP uh, current can um, compensate for the difference. Um, so th and this is because uh, in the server to bus architecture, there is an extra degree of freedom. Uh, we, um, uh, we can control the string current to be different values and uh, and the uh, DPP uh, converter current will be different, and the uh, resulting power process in the DPP converters will also be different. And there exists some optimal combinations, which, uh, which is uh, uh, the minimum process power. And we can see that in the second scenario, um, it actually corresponds to the server to virtual bus case. It process more power. Uh, than the optimal case. So if we can com control the string current to be the optimal uh, case, uh, we can achieve the minimum process power and the minimum loss. Um, so this is an advantage of the server to bus architecture. And uh, another advantage is that uh, this architecture has uh, high reliability. Uh, it can actually tolerate one converter uh, fa fail uh, open. So if we use the same example, um, so let's say that uh, and the servers are still consuming this uh, amount of current. And what if one converter fails, like uh, this converter fails? Uh, we can actually control the string current to be uh, equal to this server, this server current. And uh, uh, let the other DPU converters to compensate for the difference, and the system can still uh, can still work. So uh, we, we see that uh, this architecture can tolerate one converter failure, and uh, also as was um, uh, quantitatively analyzed in detail in this previous publication, um, this serious uh, this server to bus architecture uh, it has com uh, comparable reliability compared to conventional architecture. Um, so in short, um, the server to bus architecture has high uh, level of reliability. Uh, so um, how do we uh, realize the control for this architecture? Uh, so actually, there are two, uh, we, we are using two control algorithms. Uh, first of all, it's the bidirectional hysteresis control, which is proposed uh, uh, in, uh, in a previous publication. Um, so in this control, we are uh, monitoring the, the server uh, voltages and uh, 
the DBB converters works in an on-off mode. So we are monitoring whether the server current is within its reference voltage, and uh, we are calculating the error. So if the error falls uh, outside this band, for example, if it drops too low uh, across this limit, we will inject current and if, uh, until it hits this limit. And uh, if, if the and current, um, if the water become too high, it's almost also similar. Um, so, um, so, uh, so this control, it uh, like uh, controls the server, uh, server currents and uh, controls the DBP converter in a on-off mode. And uh, um, since it only controls the uh, server currents, we cannot realize the optimal string current in this control algorithm. Um, so uh, and the second control algorithm uh, we, uh, I, I will introduce uh, is the uh, optimal string current control. So uh, to better understand that, we can uh, have, a, have a look at this um, architecture. So this architecture, actually, we need to regulate the four ser server uh, voltages. Um, but uh, we, um, we, we can also notice that the bus voltage is also fixed. Uh, it is fixed at 48 volt. So actually, we only need to regulate three server voltages. Um, and the, the rest server voltage, is uh, it will regulate automatically. Uh, uh, and since we have four DPB converters, we can actually turn one converter off and still be able to regulate. So the, the optimal uh, string current control, um, this, uh, in this algorithm, um, the purpose is to control the string current to be optimal. And uh, uh, we control the optimal string current to be the second largest server, uh, server current. Uh, oh, is there any? OK. Uh, so actually, the optimal string current in the, in the, server, to, in the um, server to bus architecture, um, it is actually the median. Um, median of the four server currents, and uh, since the server currents there are um, there are four servers, it is actually any value between the second largest lar uh, server current and the uh, third lar largest server current. So the der derivation for the optimal string current can be uh, can be seen in the full paper. Uh, so in this optimal string current control, the, uh, uh, we control the string current to be the optimal. Uh, and here we set it to be the second largest server current. Uh, so we want it to just follow the, the server current, which is the second largest. And uh, uh, to do that, we actually uh, just turn off the DBB converter cor corresponding to the server with the second, uh, uh, second largest current. Uh, so uh, this is a, a control flow, di flow diagram, which uh, uh, like shows this control algorithm. So in this diagram, there are actually two loops. Uh, so this upper loop, this smaller loop, is the uh, uh, voltage control uh, using the, the first control method, which is the voltage hysteresis control. Uh, uh, so if you want to look in detail, so we first calculated the server voltages from our sampling. And after that, we determined the DPB converter action from the hysteresis shape, uh, so whether to uh, turn Turn, turn it on, and in either direction, we determine that. And then we ex uh, execute the action. And uh, if we reach the control period for the uh, string current, we enter this uh, bigger loop. So first, we calculate the average uh, server currents from the sampling, and uh, we determine the, so we compare the four server currents and determine which one is the large, second largest one. And then we turn off the DBB converter. Uh, we, do, uh, we decide that we, um, which converter to turn off. And then we enter back to the uh, voltage loop and uh, execu execute the action here. So here we only, uh, we, we will turn off one converter and uh, keep the uh, three remaining converters on. And their action will be, de uh, is determined here, whether to uh, inject current or reject current. So uh, these are the control algorithms that we are using. So um, next, I will introduce a um, hardware prototype. Uh, so we need uh, bidirectional isolated DC-DC converters in this algorithm. And the topology we use is uh, dual active bridge. Uh, so this is a converter that uh, I, I built. And uh, we are using GAN switches on both the primary and secondary side. 
uh, and switch, switching frequency is 200 kilohertz, peak efficiency is 95.2%, and this is the efficiency curve. So, uh, so uh, we should know that our purpose here is not to um, optimize the converter, so the converter efficiency may not be at the highest. Uh, we, we are actually just utilizing this converter to realize uh, a serious stack architecture. Um, and the uh, modulation technique is a simple phase shift. So this is the DPP converter we use, and using these converters, we build this test bed. Uh, so the server model that we are trying to de deliver power to is the Dell uh, server. Uh, um, they, they, uh, they have 12 volt input, and uh, uh, DC bus voltage is 48 volt. And uh, we run the server computation load by using the Linux, uh, Linux stress utility. And the control is uh, realized by a, a single offboard TI microcontroller. And we do the sampling from the NI data acquisition unit uh, at 5 kilohertz, at 5 kilohertz. Next, let's look at the experiment's results. Uh, the experiments are uh, 560 seconds in total. Uh, so when the, uh, for the first interval, the servers boot up. And after that, uh, they operate and uh, execute computational tasks. And finally, the servers shut down. And uh, let's look at the voltages. Um, so we can see that uh, throughout this entire test, the server voltages are regulated uh, quite well at their nom nominal 12 volts. Uh, and next, let's look at the um, intervals. Uh, when the servers do op uh, operation and come, uh, carry out computational tasks. So actually, there are two scenarios uh, that we, we do to test the serial stack uh, architecture. Uh, first of all is the balanced load scenario. When the, uh, when the four servers are all being stressed, so we run the Linux stress utility, and they all consume full power here. And the second scenario is the unbalanced load scenario, uh, where uh, three servers are being stressed. Uh, server one, server two, and server four are being stressed. And one server, server three, is kept at idle. So uh, these three servers being stressed are at high current mode, and this server is at low current mode, where the load is, um, so here the load is uh, uh, relatively unbalanced. And we use, uh, so in each of these scenarios, we use uh, uh, both of the two above mentioned control algorithms. So show in the yellow region is where we use uh, optimal string current control, and uh, the other regions is where we use uh, uh, voltage hysteresis control. Uh, so now let's look at the efficiency results. Um, so first of all, let's look at the balanced load scenario. Um, uh, so we, we can see that uh, here we are uh, delivering an approximate 450 watts to the four servers. So the four servers are all at full load. And uh, we can see that, um, so, so if we take uh, interval two, for example, you can see that uh, um, by, by delivering this uh, uh, 450 watt, we have a, a power loss of approximately 11 watt. Uh, but much, much of that 11 watt is uh, from uh, cabling, conduction loss like that. And, uh, uh, 4.67 watt are uh, due to the power con conversion in the DPP converter. And uh, um, so by calculating, uh, by using this formula, we can calculate the power conversion efficiency to be 98.99. So this is, um, so we can see that actually uh, during this balanced load scenario, um, the efficiency are all very high at around 99%. Per um, and uh, after that, uh, at the unbalanced load scenario, um, so we can see that, of course, um, since one server is at idle, the output power is lower, and uh, since there is mismatch, um, the power processed by the DPP converters are lower, and uh, uh, the, the, the power process are higher, and the, so the efficiency are, of course, a little lower. And uh, in the middle, we switch to the optimal string current control method, uh, so we can see that um, the 
uh, we, we, um, the power loss in the conversion is reduced significantly uh, by using this uh, optimal string current. And uh, uh, we can see that, um, like here, uh, in this uh, interval when we switch to the optimal string current control, the string current actually rises. Uh, it, uh, it should rise to the uh, second largest server current, uh, which is the server two here. So we can see that this uh, control algorithm is actually effective, and the efficiency and its efficiency is also higher here. So this shows the effectiveness effectiveness of this uh, proposed control algorithm. So finally, uh, the conclusion. So uh, the series uh, stacked architecture, uh, since it only processes the difference in the service power, um, it can achieve a much higher power delivery efficiency than conventional architecture. And this work is a successful hardware demonstration of the server to bus series stacked architecture in data centers uh, for data center servers that perform real life computation. And the 98.99 uh, power delivery efficiency is achieved, which is uh, four times reduction in power loss com compared to conventional architecture. And uh, the optimal string current control in the server to bus architecture is achieved, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, like results in a 20% reduction in power loss compared to the normal voltage hysteresis control during unbalanced load scenarios. So, uh, so that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. We have time for maybe two or three questions. So in the general architecture you presented, there is a step load of AC to DC. And then uh -huh. you have a DC voltage, and you feed the DC voltage to the, 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 um, the server. Uh -huh. And what is the loss on the AC to DC compared to the DC to DC in your uh, So I would say they are, they are uh, similar. So conventional architecture, they are uh, the AC to AC. So the, the DC part is about 96%. And the AC part, actually, uh, it is a simpl sim simplified uh, diagram here. Uh, I draw that the power is simply converted from uh, the grid AC to DC. But actually, they are, it's much complicated inside. There, there is uh, UPS, uninterruptible power supply. And uh, so it supplies the data center when the grid power is down. Uh, and so there are uh, actually multiple stages uh, of conversion inside that AC to DC stage. Uh, so I would say that um, f for each single stage inside that AC to DC block, it, it is also like 96% or even higher. Uh, but uh, like if you combine this cascaded stage, then it will be lower. Okay, so you, you say that essentially from the AC to DC, the last stage is higher than just from DC to DC. Uh, yeah, the overall efficiency, it should be lower. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, so we, um, we are sampling we are sampling the server currents and uh, so inside the microcontroller we um, compare the four server currents and decide which server consumes the second largest current. Okay, so that one doesn't control the string current, so you cannot achieve. Yeah, yeah. Then, then, uh, then in that situation, you will uh, be very similar to the string optimal string current control, the performance. Any questions? Yeah. Did you do anything to guarantee that the units fail open? Um, specifically well, if they uh, like fail, fail short, uh, like uh, we can have a fuse at the output terminal, and then they they also if the fuse blow up, they also like results in fail fail open. So that's how you control this the fuse to make sure it fails open. Yeah, yeah, that's how we can we can ensure that. And that's uh, yeah. Maybe I have a question. If you go back to slide eight. Uh -huh. Could you discuss uh, the experimental uncertainty for your um, 
power loss measurements because the comparison between the balanced and unbalanced case, it's important to know your uh -huh. uncertainty is half a watt, two watts, to know the meaningful impact of the algorithm. Um, so actually, uh, I think the uncertainty depends on the measurement device. Um, uh, but what we do uh, on our side to ensure that it is accurate is we, we sample the data, uh, sample a lot of data and do the average. So these, these results are the averaged uh, values. So it is average over this, like if this is a one minute and we do five kilohertz sampling, then it is like 30,000, something like that, uh, that many of sample. So even though it can be uh, some noise, some errors, in individual samples, since we do averaging, and we some, uh, I, I, I guess the noise will be um, reduced significantly. Uh, yeah, that's how we uh, ensure that uh, on our side. What if it's not noise, but a bias in these measurements? Well, uh, if it is bias in these measurements, um, so at least the relative uh, values can be uh, can be ensured. So uh, we, we, we know that uh, the optimal string current disk control algorithm has higher efficiency than the normal voltage hysteresis control. This conclusion, that conclusion can be drawn. Uh, but the absolute value for the efficiency, then that may have some inaccuracy. Then that would require some more accurate equipment, I guess. Yeah, and uh, we also, um, do the calibration of the data acquisition unit with the uh, uh, DMM. Uh, so we, we measure the actual current uh, through the DMM and also um, read the readings from the data acquisition unit. And we do a linear fit to calibrate the coefficients inside the data acquisition unit. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker. So our next speaker is Derek Chow, also from the uh, Flower Group. Uh, Derek graduated in 2015 uh, Berkeley and uh, has joined our group and has been working on control algorithms for soft switching and uh, multi-level converters. Outside the lab, uh, Derek enjoys ragtime piano. Um, so without further ado, uh, Derek will give us an overview of his work, which he'll be sharing in ECCE uh, in about a week. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. I am going to be talking about a phys zero voltage switching physically flexible multi-level GAN DC-DC converter. Uh, this is a, pre a presentation practice for ECCE 2017. So as, a, as an outline of what I'll be talking about, I'll motivate why we want to do a flexible PCB as well as a, for zero voltage switching. Uh, we'll go a little bit further into the mechanics of how to control the zero voltage switching, and then we'll go into our, our experimental results and how, how uh, we have tested uh, said converter. We'll conclude with uh, some thoughts. So why do we want to do uh, flexible PCB uh, as well as, as zero voltage switching, as well as fine faster multi-level converter? Uh, well, we like to, in, in some applications, such as uh, wind turbine uh, de-icing or, say, an electric machine where the flat surfaces are not very flat and you need power delivery, uh, it is uh, quite advantageous to have, uh, to have a lightweight uh, converter that could possibly uh, conform to the curved surfaces. But in that, in that uh, application, then you'll need something that is, that is lightweight. So you'll need something that is high power density because you will be delivering a lot of power to these machines. And you will also need uh, a way to make it conform to the surface. Now, this also is applicable in aerospace applications where you need a very high power density, very lightweight converter on, 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 an, on a mobile uh, platform. So and this 
conforms well with our research goals. We want to make a, a high power density converter with high efficiency on both the electrical and the thermal side, and we push for the light weight. So we'll do this uh, in, a number of, in a number of ways. And first of all, we will we'll address that by using a flexible converter. We'll also use a, a topology that we, that we like, the flying capacitor multi-level converter, to drop the size of, of all our components, make it lightweight. And the third thing we want to do to drop the overall size and weight of, of the converter will be zero voltage switching. So first, we'll talk about how we do this uh, high power density power converter and make, a, make it flexible. And, uh, when I say flexible, I mean conformal, uh, where we want to have a non-flat surface, uh, say, on the edge of an electric machine. Uh, there is there is a, a nice curve which we want to conform to. Uh, it also, we use something called polyamide uh, substrate. So instead of using the conventional FR4 substrate that most PCBs are made of, uh, this is this this material also is quite resistant to high voltage uh, stress, but happens to be flexible. Uh, you can make multi-layers with it, so you can design uh, your multiple layer circuit boards uh, in, in in this uh, material. And in this case, it's also thermal cycling resistant, so that's very useful in the way in the way that when when a power converter is converting power, there is a power loss. So with that power loss, uh, the converter will start to expand in, in different rates, and that with this polyamide substrate, it will take up that that thermal stress and and, and be uh, more resistant to said cycling as uh, something rigid. Uh, problem with uh, going directly to a flexible PCB substrate, uh, if you just take a power converter and, and put it on a flexible PCB, is that the components, the passive components, are, are quite large. And that doesn't work very well for if you want something that is, is conformal to, to some curved surface. So how do we want to, how do we, how do we shrink these passive components further? Uh, to to allow this flexible PCB to be to be possible, uh, we'll go into the flying capacitor multi-level converter topology. So the reason we like to use the flying capacitor multi-level topology is is that uh, not only does it spread out your spread out the high heat capacity uh, high heat generating components and over many many switches, it, it also allows it generates a high frequency switching signal at the inductor switch node and a power converter, therefore dropping the physical component size. So in, in this case, uh, we, we implemented a, a seven-level flying capacitor multi-level design. Uh, I will go into how uh, quickly how, how, this, uh, how this topology will work. So I have illustrated here uh, one, uh, two, two scenarios in, inside our, inside our uh, switch our flying capacitor multi-level operation. Uh, during periodic steady state, all of the capacitors in this uh, converter will be charged up to some fraction of the input voltage. And the voltage at the switch node is dependent on whatever switch combinations are, are present. In this case, I have highlighted two portions here where the switches will configure the switch node to be the same voltage. And over a switching period, uh, we'll see that we can uh, combine many of these switching uh, switch combinations and keep the capacitor voltages balanced uh, by having one cycle charge the capacitor and having another cycle discharge the capacitor. And over a switching period, we'll note that also that here is the switching frequency of a single switch, but since there are multiple uh, switch transitions within this uh, switching period it, it makes the inductor ripple frequency uh, some multiple of the number of levels in the converter, uh, therefore increasing the switching frequency of the inductor and therefore dropping the size of, of the inductor. Now, even with the multi-level converter topology, uh, this means that uh, we have smaller passive components, but even with this multi-level topology, we still need to switch very quickly to, to drop the components further. So with the so with our fl flexible PCB and the flying past multi-level, we're still a little bit too large on the passive components side. So so how do we how do we address this problem of large passive components? We'll zoom in further onto one of these switch transition periods. So one of the solutions for making uh, passive components smaller is to switch faster. Uh, but however, switching faster also means that there are larger switching losses in the devices. 
So we want to turn on our switches when the drain source voltage across the, the devices is zero volts. Uh, that will highly reduce, large, lar reduce largely the, the switching losses that occur in the switches when you turn them on and off. So we'll, the, the, there are some challenges to uh, said uh, control. Uh, there, we have to switch very quickly, and therefore that means that the parasitics in, this, in the system will, will matter a lot. Well, there is a, we need to design the converter with a large inductor ripple. And in fact, we take advantage of, of this inductor ripple to charge up the parasitic capacitance in the, in the switches, as I will note. And the full zero voltage switching is dependent on the load. So let's go into the mechanics of how uh, zero voltage switching uh, would work in, in, our, in this case. So I'll focus on the rightmost switch pair of, of the flying capacitor multi-level converter. Here I have noted on, at, at this point TI1 to TI2, so both switches are now off. The inductor current is positive. The inductor current will discharge the parasitic capacitance of the bottom switch, uh, therefore dropping the voltage across it. At the point uh, TI2, the voltage across this switch is now zero. And once we turn on this switch, uh, the, the, since the drain source voltage is zero, uh, we happen to have zero voltage switching here. During, so then at this point, the switch is on, and the other switch pairs will commutate. I will note that this is the, the interval that we're talking about here. So we have just turned off the rightmost switch. I turned on the, the, the bottom switch of the rightmost pair. And now there are many other switching transitions in between and the inductor current is, is rippling. And then we'll, we're about to get to the point where we want to turn on the topmost switch. So during that time, well, once, we've, once we get, let's zoom back in here, we can see that the inductor current is now, is now negative, is, is going negative, which means that one can turn off the bottom switch, therefore uh, allowing the inductor current to charge up the parasitic capacitance of the bottom switch which means that the voltage of this capacitor will now rise to equal the flying capacitor voltage here. And at that point that the capacitor voltages are equal, uh, we again have zero volts across another switch. That zero volt across the top switch here means that you can turn it on and achieve zero voltage switching on the top, uh, very low loss. Once that switch is on, the cycle can continue, and the inductor current will reverse, and we can achieve this for all of the switch pairs in the converter. Well, I would like to note that uh, for any arbitrary switch pair, this this is possible. We have uh, we've seen in, in some previous slides that there's many 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 switch transitions, and in the way that uh, the inductor current is flowing through the entire circuit. Uh, we can see that if the rightmost pair has the top switch on, the current paths will all still work out. So that means that we can achieve zero voltage switching across all of the switches inside this uh, flying past multi-level converter. So as a realization for all of these three concepts, we have uh, implemented this uh, the seven level flying past multi-level converter on a flexible PCB and uh, controlling it uh, for zero voltage switching. Here are, here's the flexible PCB prototype. You can see that there's the, the conversion core here, the logic and power isolators for the signals and the flying capacitors on the back side. And also of note is, is that all of the passive components are, are very small. Uh, these are the passive components and the active components on the entire converter. We'll note that these are the connectors for the power. So in, in, the, in that case, uh, this is, uh, we can see that we have achieved a very, very thin, flexible converter. I'll talk a little bit about how we control the, the zero voltage switching in, in the converter. Uh, we'll, we'll note that uh, previously we've, we've noted that the inductor current must go negative for a little bit to allow the parasitic capacitance on that bottom switch to charge up to the proper voltage. Uh, therefore, uh, we can change the uh, switching frequency of, of the converter should the output voltage and the input voltage remain constant. So then we measure the output current here. 
uh, we take the ripple current and then set that to be to, to allow the the inductor ripple to go slightly negative, uh, therefore allowing the parasitic capacitance to charge up the bottom switch voltage. And then we can adjust the switching frequency to make this uh, optimal zero voltage switching happen for a wide range of loads. Another note about the flying capacitor multi-level topology is that there is a there are points in the in the in the uh, converter control where the duty ratio will con control the amount of output current ripple. So with a conventional converter, we can see that here that there is a there is a duty ratio of 0.5 where the where the converter current uh, current ripple is is maximized. With higher numbers of levels, then the the ripple current is is now smaller, and then there are different points of of maximums of of current ripple, but for this for this purposes of this work, uh, we'll say that because there there are there are points where the where it is not possible to get zero voltage switching because there's there, there's no current ripple, uh, but we'll for now we will test our converter at the points where there is a lot of current ripple and prove that we can uh, indeed achieve a zero voltage switching for at least some cases of uh, in the flying capacitor multi-level topology. So we've, we've uh, set our switching frequency for each of these switches at uh, 200 to 500 kilohertz. Uh, it varies with load. And we have tested uh, rip with ripple frequencies of up to 3 megahertz at the inductor uh, switch node. And we've tested for the, the base cases of 58% uh, duty ratio and 25% duty ratio, which we'll note here for the seven level flying capacitor multi-level is a point of a very high current ripple. So we're switching really fast. We have a flexible PCB and we have very small pa uh, passive components. Uh, we were able to achieve uh, quite reasonable efficiencies for the for the different uh, test cases. So at uh, 90, at, at D equals 58%, we were able to get to about 98.5% peak uh, with different duty ratio. D equals 25%, uh, we were able to get about 90. Six and a half percent. This is converting from 200 volts to 116 volts, or uh, 200 volts to uh, 100, to uh, 50 volts. As an illustration to what happens if we don't control the zero voltage switching uh, with the, with relation to the load, uh, I, we have done some experiments where we have a fixed switching frequency and then vary the load on on each of these each of these cases uh, and uh, compared it to if we were able to control it with this zero voltage switching. We'll note that for a fixed frequency, there is a point where, where optimal zero voltage switching occurs. The current ripple is, 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 in, is enough to charge the parasitic capacitance up to the proper voltages. Uh, and above said load, then the, then the inductor current never goes negative, and you only get hard switching, and uh, you lose your zero voltage switching. So that is why we want to, we want to control our zero voltage switching control. And furthermore, uh, to to tie back into our earlier notes about going for high power density, high lightweight, well, we were able to achieve uh, a very very lightweight converter. This this converter processes 250 watts and weighs only 17 and a half grams, and, and is and is flexible. Uh, we were able to to achieve very high power density and high specific power density. That's uh, kilowatts per kilograms. 14 kilowatts per kilogram is is uh, quite good for a mobile application. So in conclusion, uh, we've, we've proven, uh, de demonstrated that uh, zero voltage switching is possible for a flying capacitor multi-level converter. Uh, we've demonstrated that it is, it is possible to make a flexible converter and also apply all of these, uh, all of these concepts to, to the converter. We've noted that a uh, possible future uh, work that we can do is, is to implement this on a 3D electro thermal application, maybe have it uh, conform to a heat sink on, on a not flat surface, and further layout optimizations, we can potentially make uh, higher power density, higher power uh, converters uh, in the future. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. Thanks. So in the in, in bulk, the flexible PCBs are are more expensive. Uh, they're uh, to to give you an example, maybe uh, we can get 
20 of these boards for $700, whereas 20 of, a, of an FR4 is, is maybe worth 200, right? So then there's a two to three X cost increase, but I'd like to argue that that two, two, two to three X cost increase is quite worth the amount of, of weight savings and the ability to be uh, conformal. Okay, so, so that, that's a pretty good question there. Uh, you can take your big picture schematic design and put that into a flexible design, but now, now in, the, in the flexible design, you must uh, take into account where you're going to be flexing the PCB. So then at the point of flexure, you now have to uh, carefully design your traces. Uh, they have to be 90 degrees to the bend. You have to check for bend radii. You have to check for clearances for what happens when you bend the PCB. Um, things like that will, will change. But overall, your, your overall schematic will not need to change too much. Can you explain why the deficiencies in the previous slide, and maybe you mentioned this, why they aren't more? Here? Yeah. Ah, okay. So at, uh, at a fixed frequency, when you're running a, a converter at fixed, the, the converter at fixed frequency, there, there is a point where there's forced continuous conduction mode, uh, where the current goes negative. And we slowly increase our efficiency as as uh, as we increase the load, and at some point there's there's an optimal point where the where the point where the current goes negative is just enough to charge up the parasitic capacitance at the bottom switches to achieve zero voltage switching. But then above that point, the negative current does uh, either is not enough or doesn't exist, and, and therefore you go back into your hard switching, which is uh, much less efficient than if you used a CPS. Right. Uh, and then would that come in as a trade-off, or is it not? Right. So, so that's a, that's also a very good question. The inductor is uh, 0.66 microhenries. Uh, if you were to design set the same specs for uh, hard switching, it would be 10 times that. And because the inductor is such a low value, the core losses are, are also lowered by a lot. But yes. The, the, in fact, I can uh, have a backup slide here. Uh, we can see that in the so I've, I've compared zero voltage switching versus hard switching here in this thermal images here. We can see that most of the loss in, in zero voltage switching comes from the inductor side of, uh, of, of things. So yes, core losses uh, make, a, make, make a very big difference. You have to be careful on, on designing the inductor. Further questions? All right, let's thank our speaker. for coming to 590. If you're going to stay for the Pecky uh, meeting, please uh, join us for that as well.